this officially. Uh, so, hey everybody, you are in tune to Shifty Perspective, episode number three, and hopefully you can hear me loud and clear, unlike last time where the microphone wasn't working correctly. And uh, if you can't, then please do say in the comments, and I will try to do something about it during the episode, although it should be touch wood working now. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to start off by introducing our guest this week. We have the very, very, very interesting, intellectual, uh, a man of many talents who I've known for quite a long time now. Uh, this guy is a, an author, a psychologist, a positive psychologist. He teaches, he gives seminars, uh, he's an awesome DJ, he's kind of just an all-round talented, awesome guy. Uh, this is Yannick. Jacob, please say hello. Hello. <laughs> hey. how are you doing man i'm doing like like strangely well in these uh, unwell times i guess uh, nice. it's uh, weirdly normal for me um in a way that you know my my days don't really s uh, change in terms of their structure you know i still um you know see my clients from here i work from home mostly in this uh, in my consulting room you know i see clients via zoom um you know two-thirds of my clients were online anyway um okay. But then there's all this extra bit around what the fuck is going on in the world right now. And, uh, you know, interesting to see people's perspectives. Some of them got quite shifty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, but I'm, yeah, to, to answer the question, I'm, 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 I'm doing all right, man. Thanks. That's good. You, to be honest, you, you always seem very, very positive, which is admirable. <laughs> Even in uh, high stress situations, uh, whether that's your wedding or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> gathering a bunch of people up who are trying organizing or friends who are drunk and wasted and making sure that everybody's together. You always seem to be positive. So yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite admirable. Have you, um, yeah. have you found, uh, now at the moment that your clients that you work with are, are struggling more with mm -hmm. things and are they wanting to not do work, work with you mm -hmm. as much? Is that an issue or? Yeah, I thought it was an issue initially, um, you know, because nobody really knew where this is going to go. Um, and I think uh, like some some clients, obviously, they struggle for money and they, they just can't invest right now. I generally think right now is the, the best time to invest in yourself. If you have any resources left, I could always uh, recommend coaching, you know, finding the right person to work with. And if that's not coaching for you, but maybe like a grief counselor or, you know, maybe it's a spiritual healer or, you know, maybe it's a yoga instructor or a chiropractor like this. Reaching out for help right now is probably a good yeah. idea um, if you can somehow afford it, you know, if you're not struggling to put food on the table. Um, I've had quite a lot of clients recently actually uh, knocking on my door. Um, given my existential work, you can imagine there's a lot of people are sitting at home and uh, in quite a few countries, they're getting 80 percent of their salary. Uh, but they have nothing to do, you know, and they have all this extra time to ask themselves big questions about life and where they are going, you know, how many people distract yeah. themselves from, you know, living quite inauthentically, perhaps, or, you know, uh, this, this kind of break, some people go on holiday, and they need to go whitewater rafting, because if they're just sitting on a beach contemplating, then all of this stuff comes up that they have been suppressing for years. So I think for some people, they find themselves in this kind of situation, where they're sitting at home, and their life got disrupted, and they can't, go out and distract themselves you know and then maybe they run out of shit on Netflix to watch and now they're asking themselves some of these questions that have been lingering there for years so I have some of those clients asking um, who they are and and like yeah almost it's almost scary I guess like to to have that suddenly put upon you like oh shit like it's mm -hmm. it's me now and just my head my brain mm -hmm. which I think generally is a very positive thing it might not feel yeah. great you know it might not feel positive but I think uh, it's like you get forced to con reconsider some things. You, you get forced, so to speak, to question what you're doing with your life. And I think that can only be a positive uh, uh, process. You know, yeah. it can be a bit excruciating if you feel that maybe you've wasted 10 years or maybe you aren't living the life that you wanted to live. Or maybe you had some dreams and aspirations when you were younger. And now where I am at, life just kind of happened to me. I've just yeah. kind of got lived by life rather than making authentic choices. But it's also an opportunity to maybe do something different. So I definitely have those clients who are coming in and say, 
well, I now, I, I wanna do something differently. I wanna make some more courageous choices. I wanna more, uh, live more authentically. Um, but then there's also lots of people who just, you know, use their time uh, effectively and coaching yeah. is a way to, you know, use your time very effectively um, to maybe get that side hustle off the ground or maybe mm -hmm. read those books or learn that language that you always wanted to. Um, and then, uh, you know, I train a lot of coaches. Uh, so there's a lot of people who are now coming from events or hospitality and the industry has collapsed. And they want to, they always wanted to be a life coach. So they always found themselves having those conversations that help people. And they're like, I can actually make a living out of that and actually keep earning um, while we're in lockdown. So there's a, a good number of people uh, that have approached me to, you know, train as a coach one-to-one -one or in, in groups. Do you think after the uh, lockdown, there's going to be a lot of uh, life coaches and there's not going to be a uh, leisure industry and uh, <laughs> it's going to have this kind of uh, crossover clash maybe with. <laughs> I think, I think it's a, there's a crossover. I don't necessarily think there's a clash because the people mm -hmm. who are already interested uh, in, in the kind of life coaching space, they've already been helping people uh, figure stuff out or giving people good experiences. And there's yeah. such a broad range of coaches out there. Um, for example, that, that one person that I'm thinking about who works in hospitality, she's always helped people figure life out. And her hospitality business was, was actually about that. You know, she was like giving people an experience of community and, uh, you know, helping people who were maybe in a tough spot to kind of find themselves again. Um, so and I find that a lot of people um, don't change in terms of the kind of people that they are. They just change the way that that expresses itself. Well, do you think that in, the, in this moment, the people like that will really kind of have the opportunity to engage with other people? Or I, I'm guessing like when you're, I don't know where, where I am, you're still interacting with people. But in the UK, I mean, you're, you're in London right now, I guess. So yeah, I'm in East London. Yeah. Okay. So like, if, if people are wanting to kind of take your advice and, and help um, coach other people, is it only possible via the internet right now? Or, or is it something that people are able to bring to their families and kind of, um, mm. yeah, practice like that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, when you learn coaching skills, um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people who set out uh, to become a coach and they never become a coach as such. You know, I, I think, I don't know about the numbers, but uh, it feels to me that there's about what, 40%, 50% even of uh, people who go through coach training, they don't yeah. become coaches. They don't work as a coach. They don't huh. sit down one-to-one -one and get paid for their coaching services, but they become better communicators. They have become better at recognizing other people's emotions. They become better at, you know, contracting in terms of, uh, yeah. you know, setting out how this conversation will go. You mm -hmm. know, they, they're better, they're more assertive or um, they, they get to know themselves better. They become more reflective. Um, you know, so after a conversation, maybe they think about what just happened, they're more able to structure a conversation. Yeah. So all of these things, they will help you in sales, they will help you in negotiations, they will help you in pretty much anything that you do, because coaching is about relating to people, it's building a relationship in which somebody else can grow. So every parent will use some coaching skills when they're parent, yeah. you know, there's some crucial differences in how you parent and how you coach somebody. But I think coaching is about learning. So if you help somebody learn, you're going to use that as a manager, as a leader, mm -hmm. as a parent, as a friend. You know, it's just a really good way of relating to people. So I yeah, see... you don't need to become a coach in order to, to use those skills. I, I, I can see that that would be pretty effective or, or I guess really important for people in positions of power because um, mm. I don't know, like experiencing other people in like the, the corporate world, whatever you want to call it, there's um a lot of isolation and distancing from from other people and uh, empathy and not really understanding you know people on i guess on different levels so I, I can imagine that it would be a good thing to have all like you know ceos or people in positions of power to, to to kind of learn coaching skills so that they can actually use that and be human i guess <laughs> it seems almost <laughs> like you teach people to be human <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there's there's a lot of coaching skills courses for managers and leaders, for example. And uh, I really, really like that development um, because coaching has only been around for a couple of decades, you know. Yeah. And it's like I was lucky enough that I was able to study it uh, straight off my university degree. You know, there there weren't any masters in coaching up until I think the first one was in Sydney about 15, 20 years ago. 
um, but there's 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 not been around. So now that uh, leaders and managers and people in organizations actually realize, with a millennial generation sitting in those uh, in those chairs and you know mm -hmm. um, having taken over the workforce to some degree, um, they want a more human relationship. You know, they yeah. want to be treated as a human and not uh, not as like just a cog in the wheel that makes somebody money. You know, I think um, our parents were much more uh, able to kind of uh, bear the mindset of, hey, work is just something that you do. You know, it's yes. work called yeah. work for a reason. You know, you just kind of get through it and then life happens five to nine. Um, and I think there's a generation that is not satisfied with that. They're, they're like, that, sh that shouldn't be the case. You know, I should actually be treated like a human being and my work should mean something. And that's where uh, a leader and a manager or somebody who works with a team or, you know, just they would do so well to communicate well from the heart, the whole start with why some in cynic stuff, you know, if you show up as a human being with actual values yeah. and an actual mission, not just something on your website, but something that you believe in, <laughs> then your people will work harder. And the research shows that people work harder. They take less sick leave. They, they yeah. pull more weight. They get more creative. They walk the extra mile. They change jobs less often. You know, it's, it has so many positive effects on, on everybody around you. Do you find that it's more, I guess, millennials and younger people that are actually taking the initiative for this? Like if you, um, you know, would you, do you speak to your parents about, well, obviously they know what you do, but <laughs> are they, is it all a bit like, really, you know, you do just go to work and you do just do that. Or, or, or do you think there are people in the, um, you know, I guess above the age of 50, 60 who, who are open-minded and coming around to the, the newer view of it, things. Yeah, I think more people get it. I mean, it's difficult to generalize, right? Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, scientists often try to generalize, but uh, that's that's empirical studies. That's kind of what they're made for. But uh, I, I got really lucky with my parents because they always kind of let me do what I want and kind of trusted that I'll find my authentic way in that. And that if yeah. you do something because you really want to do it, you're probably going to become successful. Um, and thank God that kind of worked out like that. Um, but I think there's a lot of parents who don't quite get that because they're maybe not so open-minded or they, you know, uh, like they it's a struggle more to leave that kind of mindset that got hammered into their heads. Um, but that was a lot more liberal than a lot of other dads, you know? So uh, I, I think it, it crucially forms us, uh, the kind of yeah. parents that we have and the mindset that develops from that. And I think this is, again, where coaching, or it doesn't have to be a coach. It can be somebody with a shifty perspective, you know, it just kind of <laughs> opens up your mind a little bit and asks you some questions that you hadn't considered before. Yeah. I think through that, you can, uh, you can make better choices because you know there's, there's different ways of being out there and different perspectives on that. You know, maybe to some people it's revelational. Maybe work could be something that means something. Maybe it's yeah. not something that I have to get through. Maybe it could be fun and engaging. You know, maybe that would mean I have to make some very like courageous and perhaps risky decisions. And maybe I have to fall flat on my face a couple of times. Or maybe I have to start my way up from the ground up again. You know, mm -hmm. maybe I, I change my careers and I start from the bottom. You know, maybe I lose all of that status or perhaps a part of my identity even if I do something radically different from now on. Maybe I lose some friends on the way. You know, maybe I estrange my partner or, you know, these are these are things that happen when we uh, do things differently going forward. It's um, scary because you ask yourself these questions and then you're like, oh shit, you know, like yeah, what happens if I have spent the last ten years doing something that I shouldn't have, well, that I don't feel I should have done or that I've wasted time? And then people often, I mean, I imagine people are then stuck where they think they're so far with something, you know, say they've been in a career for fifteen years, and then they want to change it, but they think, well. I lose that 15 years and I've got to start from scratch. Can I do that? And yeah. Just... yeah. And that is really scary. But what if you don't, what, what if yeah. you sit there in 40 years and you're like, oh. I wish I would have done something 25 years ago when I was only 15 years in. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> I mean, I have that with some of my younger clients, you know, they're like, they're two or three years into, let's say a law uh, degree, you know, yeah. or, or medicine. And then they realize maybe I've, chosen that because it was the safe route you know but actually I, it wasn't really I think I kind of made that decision for somebody else maybe Especially I wanted parents. to yeah parents or what society is uh, wants us to be or like that's something that you just do um, and actually they want to be an artist you know I have a friend who who he's a 
super skilled photographer and I wish he would have become a photographer, oh. but he chose a very different route. And I think he still is a photographer, you know, but uh, what, what if? What if he had chosen that differently? Maybe, maybe he would have really struggled and there's no money in photography. But, uh, you know, where I rented a desk for years, uh, the person uh, next to me is from Hamburg and he's a super skilled photographer and earning really good money with it. So, you know, never know. You if never know. Yeah, I, I love reading well. Tim Ferriss for that. Um, Tim Ferriss mm -hmm. in, uh, interviewed a ton of people who are very, very, very successful. And what I've noticed as a pattern is that's a lot of people who've chosen to do things that were quite unorthodox, but they combined different areas. Um, you know, there was like a chef who was also a mathematician or something, you know, and they brought things together that were unusual and hence they kind of stuck out, you know, yeah. and a lot of that would make you successful because it turns heads, you know, if you like, we've tried so hard to fit in, but then there comes a time in our life where we just try to be special, you know, uh, and that's such an interesting dichotomy. I actually had a, a interesting meeting with someone earlier and quite nothing to do with um, it wasn't intending to have any conversations about this. It was a purely a business meeting, but um, he actually asked me some questions about like this kind of thing, what we're talking about. You know, he said, uh, what, what do you define as success um, in life and what do you define as winning in life, uh, which I gave you know, an answer on the spot, but it's something since then I, I you know I thought about it for the past few hours. It's quite interesting, you know what what is, you know, if you speak to a there are there are lots of multimillionaires who are very very unhappy, and you know there are lots of people who are uh, you know on minimum wage or just doing uh, having a uh, you know uh, they're artists and they're just doing what they want to do, but they are so so happy and so free. So, I mean if you don't go for the thing that you want to then who knows because you you might end up with mm. with all that money and you've gone into a career you might be a doctor because your parents pressured you to be a doctor but then you might fucking hate it you know so i think the uh, question do you have is like oh sorry go on yeah no i think the question is super important to ask and i actually ask it fairly often um what, what, how do you define success? How do you yeah. define winning? How do you define happiness? Don't usually use the word winning because it, it kind of doesn't quite sit with my philosophy of like, you, know, you can't, uh, yeah, you can't win <laughs> life. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an infinite game, you know, there's, there's yeah. no winning. It's like business. You can't win at business. I mean, you can smash your annual goals or your five year mm -hmm. business plan, but there's no winning business. Like, it's it's made to be infinite yeah it's temporary um, and infinite at the same time it's not a it's never a, a permanent yeah it depends so much about how, what you want from life you know and mm -hmm. that's a question of uh, what do you value you know and the word value sometimes it's a bit uh, tacky but like uh, it really what it means is what's important to you and that has to be your own metrics you know that has to be defined by the individual there are certain values like certain groups value or an organization or company values or a group of friends values, you know, honesty or, um, you know, achievement or courage or like um, the VIA values in action uh, strength assessment in positive psychology. It's uh, used quite heavily um, where where um, uh, Seligman and Peterson have gone through all of the culturally important texts. Um, obviously not all of them, but like a very the chunky nature. selection. Um, and they've analyzed um, the themes that came out of these stories, religious texts, um, tales people told each other, like the stuff that we seem to value as a culture and looked okay. at the virtues um, that come out of these. And they arrived at six virtues and 24 character strengths. The things that, that drive people, the, thing, the things that we, we can be naturally quite good at you know, like courage uh, is, a, is, a, uh, is a strength, is a virtue in action. So if we look at what's important to you, what do you care about? For example, those situations when you get very emotional, uh, either very frustrated or angry or furious or something that cracks you up or something that brings tears of joy to your eyes. You know, in those moments, one of your values or several in combination have gotten touched on, you know, or attacked. You know, for example, I, I get very emotional when I see uh, unfairness, you know, when I see injustice, you know, it gets yeah. to me because my mom really strongly has that instilled in me. And uh, that's something I value, you know. So a lot of what I do today is, uh, is driven, is fueled 
uh, by those kind of values. And they have, uh, they have been established at some point in our past through the life story we've lived, the experiences we've had and how we've made sense of them. You know, we, something happens when we're a kid and then somebody helps us to make sense of that in a certain way. Yeah. You know, somebody gets uh, punched in the face and, you know, one dad might tell you, oh, uh, probably uh, he shouldn't have provoked this guy. When the other one says violence is wrong, you should never hit anybody. It's always bad. You know, and so they're gonna they're gonna grow up with different kind of values and stories within themselves, and those are the things that influence how we define winning, how we define success. Because if yeah. we live in accordance with our values and what drives us, I think you know you live authentically. You have more positive emotions because you feel more aligned with what you believe in. There's less uh, conflict, you yeah. know. There's less tension and friction, and the more tension and fr the less tension and friction there is, the more harmony you have. And that's a, that's a peace of mind that is really enjoyable, you know, and beyond being a human being in the world with other people, which brings with it a bunch of tensions and paradoxes mm -hmm. and dilemmas, you know, beyond the existential dilemmas and paradoxes, we can actually resolve a lot of the friction that we have with the world by uh, adopting a certain mindset or by working towards certain values that we have. And if we do that well, and I think a coach can help you with that, but like you don't need a coach necessarily in order to do that. You know, if you live in core, if you identify your values and what's important to you, and then you align your life with those kind of values, then you're much, much more likely to consider your life a success as such, I think. Are those, um, are those values, the, the six values that you, uh, that these um, researchers discovered or, mm -hmm. or came to the conclusion of, are these, over uh, time, so taking say, say like biblical parables and uh, um, all different texts, like ranging from uh, you know thousands of years ago, and seeing how we've we've as a culture, just across the world as humans, sorry, not just as a culture, or is it, are the are these cultural values, or does that come into different mm -hmm. kind of? Yeah, so these are virtues that are being shared um, collectively as mm -hmm. species, it seems. And okay. not everybody shares the same values. You know, for example, uh, honesty is probably more valued in Germany than in perhaps other parts of the world. Um, but they, are, they generally are being found all over the world. And uh, we have different combinations of these. So these 24 character strengths, um, they can be in any order. And there, there's a free yeah. test out there, actually. I mean, I don't like to call it test because it kind of implies you can fail it and there's no failing character okay. strength. <laughs> um, but there's a free uh, survey and uh, you can do that. It's the VIA Institute of Character Strengths. If you Google that, VIA Character Strengths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If you can uh, send, send me that afterwards or we'll put it up in the uh, description of this. Just Yeah, as, for sure. Uh, as a, anyone who's listening can... Uh, Te test their strength of character or not that test their strength of character see what, yeah, yeah see assess what. it or like uh, identify it because mm -hmm. everybody has 24 you know some are more in the top and some are more at the bottom the ones at the bottom are not, not a weakness necessarily um yeah. it's just least developed you know so if we look at the top five uh, they call you signature strengths and uh the theory goes and this is very much uh, found in practice and i work with this quite a lot is uh if you use those top strengths a lot in your daily life, you're gonna feel a lot more energized by them. You know, it's like if your job is aligned with those strengths, if you're, for example, if kindness is one of your strengths and uh, you work a, a, in a restaurant as a waiter or a waitress, you know, yes. and you have the opportunity to be kind to people. Um, and it's the kind of setup where you actually have enough time and maybe it's like a smaller restaurant in a smaller town and you know the people there and you're giving them a good experience and you're going like you're going out of the way to be extra kind to people that's going to energize you you know and if it's something yeah. that you don't use it depletes you you know then work depletes you but if yes. you choose a line of work or you choose your employees for example and hire them based on the strengths that they need in order to do the job mm -hmm. then you have somebody who's going to get energized by the job you know, they will want to come to work because they yeah. get something from it and it's meaningful to them. It's intrinsically motivating. They don't need a reward for it. You know, the kind of things we do for hobbies, 
we don't need to get paid for it because we do them because we like doing it. That's you know? very, very true. And, and it's also contagious as well. So if you have uh-huh. that around you or people, uh, you know, in a restaurant is a prime example. Like uh, if, if you've got a waitress, a waiter, a server who is really positive and genuinely happy and engaging, well, then that lifts the mood of everybody else up. And it's, yeah, it's contagious. You know, someone's giggling and stuff, you know, you, you start giggling and stuff too. So mm-hmm. yeah, I guess, uh, and, and the same in the workplace. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For example, a lot, of, a lot of coaches come with the top strengths of love of learning. You know, some people, Mm. they don't really enjoy learning so much. It's kind of a chore. Other people, they get, they're fascinated by it. You know, they do podcasts because they're really curious about people. Joe Rogan is somebody who has a lot of curiosity and interest in the world, you know, and he can just sit down with somebody and be curious about what's going on for them. You know, you you don't need to pay him for that. He would probably do it anyway. Yeah. You know, Um, and if you set up your, your life and sometimes you can be in a job that is like not very engaging and a bit boring. But if you build in, if you identify your character strengths and then you change certain things, for example, you can make things more playful, you know, or you can build in a little competition, you know, maybe how can you build kindness into your job? You know, this can be little things that you do, Um, but they will be the ones that energize you, which, uh, you know, make you perhaps like going to work again. Well, do you, um, do you, do you struggle to, um, or have you ever struggled to um, apply these uh, methods to yourself? You know, like when you, um, because I mean, I often find it's easier to, you you know, you can, you, uh, you can tell somebody and give people pointers, but when it comes to applying it to yourself, it can be quite difficult. Um, Mm -hmm. When you first analyzed yourself and saw uh, the main six points, did you, were you able to quite quickly focus on those or or was it, was it a struggle? Yeah, well, I think it's, it, we always have some blind spots, right? Um, mm-hmm. There's always things yeah. that we struggle with. No human being is perfect. Um, a lot of these things, when I came across them, I first noticed the ones that I'm already doing, you know, and I realized, oh, that's why I'm quite positive or that's why I'm quite resilient or, you know, that's why I'm quite happy generally because I I'm, I'm, have built these kind of habits into my life already and this is kind of relate to people. But then you start realizing, oh, there's stuff that, I really should be doing, but I'm not. Um, For example, uh, eating healthy, sleeping an appropriate amount of hours for most people (laughs) between seven and nine, Um, doing some form of meditation and exercising regularly. You know, those are the four pillars of health and well-being that are so basic and so simple to do. And they change people's, like some people's life, they change radically. They just do the very basic. Eat healthy and you like generally people know what it means to eat healthy Mm -hmm. you know i know what it means to eat healthy but i'm a sucker for a pizza and like (laughs) i know i know where this developed from like not having healthy eating habits but i generally know what i would need to be doing in order to eat more healthy and when i do you know i immediately feel the effect that it has on me you know i immediately feel if i don't get enough sleep i feel it Uh, Mm -hmm. you know but like then it's like 10, 11, and at 11, I'm like, yeah, if I go to bed now, tomorrow will be a much better day. But then I watch another episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that happens. It's like you, even if you know what's good for you, you we often don't do it. And I'm because... no saint in that, you know, uh, I should be uh, going exercising every morning because I know it makes me feel a lot better. And I don't. Um, so there's a self-discipline thing going on. Yeah, everybody struggles with some of those things. Well, the not good things, the naughty things uh, feel better in the short term, right? So, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's like, well, I know I shouldn't eat this pizza, but then, you know, whatever, you eat the pizza and you feel great whilst you're eating that pizza. <laughs> Obviously, afterwards, it's like, shit, I eat this pizza and then you're feeling, you know, negative about it. The same for... Oh, I don't I... No? <laughs> <laughs> I feel great after I eat pizza. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Depends uh, on the pizza. I've... Sometimes, uh, you know, there's a specific pizza that, uh, you know, like about 45 minutes later, I, I somewhat regret that. Oh, it's heavy. And you're just like, oh, <laughs> shit. No. <laughs> no, but if you eat pizza all the time, you just get so used to the heaviness. You don't notice That's the difference. True. So um, yeah. it's like I noticed when I started eating uh, much healthier, like the first time I went on like a proper diet, I really wanted to tackle this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and for like two weeks, I was only eating green veg and a lot of cucumber, a bit of hummus and you know, um, no, no processed food. Um, and I immediately now, felt it was an amazing difference, just more yeah. focus, more energy, 
you know, a better mood, uh, more motivation to get stuff done that means something, more space to think. It was incredible. And I still kept falling back because, yeah, we, are, we like to be comfortable and we like to give way to, uh, to immediate reward, right? How, I, what I, I don't understand uh, what, what a good way to motivate someone is who, who struggles with it. Um, like, because for me, I, I've, I'm quite self-disciplined. So I know that if I just, there's been many times where I've just signed up to the gym and then I, you know, I've gone a few times and I just stop. But now I know I will work out every single day and I, I don't allow myself an excuse, but I tell myself this and it works for me. But when, you know, when I've got friends who say to me, oh, I'm struggling, how do you do it? And I just say, you just do it. And I'm almost a bit militaristic <laughs> about it. And they're like, oh, that doesn't, you know, it kind of puts them off of anything. So like, yeah. how would you, um, how would you try to help somebody who is struggling with the motivation to eat healthy or struggling with the motivation to work out regularly when they know they, when they want to, but yeah that is hard how would you do that yeah um you're talking about what i call the jfdi principle okay. just fucking do it <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> um it's easy for some and it's harder for others this is where it starts getting a bit complex right um and uh, what the coaching approach to it would be to start uh, like the, the coaching is not one thing it's a huge range of, of approaches but like one, one approach to tackle this would be to uh, work with some accountability setting some goals um yeah. really envisioning the result you would be getting from this where do you want to go who do you want to be you know um phrasing your goals positively for example not like i want to stop smoking but i want to be healthier yeah. you know um and then you try to be as smart about it as possible and by smart i mean uh, specific measurable achievable relevant mm -hmm. to your goals and values and beliefs um and time bound you know give yourself some deadlines even if yeah. it's like a daily thing um, I think start that's so small important. develop yeah. a habit start small don't go to the gym like don't meditate an hour a day start with a one mindful breath you know everybody has a few moments where they just you know breathe really intent uh, intently you know and really notice how the air is going into your lungs and what's going on in this present moment right now. You know, if you have three minutes, meditate for three minutes, but do it consistently. Yeah. Even Go three minutes the, is, you notice yeah. the change. <laughs> do, do one push up every day. One, just one, commit to one, you know, nice. and do yeah. one regularly for a month if it needs to be, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe every week you do one more, you know, um, but like that's something that's easy to commit to. And it's like, you need to just do one push up. You know, yeah. everybody can do that. That's not there's a no big excuse. ask. Exactly. Um, so um, there's a lot of work with habits that are really useful that we can use. Um, but that's the kind of bottom up, as I call it. You know, you, you start just working with behavior change, uh, yeah. incremental behavior change, and then you put up the ante. You know, um, you, you work with some accountability and say, hey, send me a message every day until after you've done your push up. You know, so you have somebody that you feel accountable to. Could be a friend yeah there's a website I, I i don't remember what it was but you basically uh transfer the money and then every time you do it and you say i've done it then they transfer you some money back <laughs> brilliant that's really so, good but that's kind of tricking yourself right uh, yeah then you need to remove this accountability because otherwise you know as soon as the accountability is removed you fall back into old patterns mm -hmm. But yeah. the idea is that once you do a little exercise, you notice the effects that are positive and then you keep 100%. it going because you naturally get rewarded for it. But that's all bottom up. That. Yeah. yeah, that's all bottom up. That's kind of working with the behavior. Um, yeah. The top down approach, would that be? That's a, that's a conversation about what's holding you back, what's blocking you from doing this. Um, how did you become that person that doesn't value uh, exercise or? Where, where do you think this is going to go if you keep doing this? You know, if you keep not exercising, well, what's going to happen? Do you want to live that kind of life? You know, um, so you, can, you can move into the deeper psychology um, in various different ways and figure out what, are, what is holding you back from doing the thing that you value. You know, maybe you don't value it enough. Maybe there's a conversation that can help you value it more. Maybe there's a conversation that can help you see that there's something you want to avoid at all costs. You know, um, I've had a client, for example, they realized that if they don't get into healthy living now, they won't be able to play football with their grandkids. 
something that yeah. they really, really valued with their granddad and something that they will definitely want to do with their kids. And through that conversation, they realized, yeah, I'm not going to like the way it's going now. I can't see myself play football in like 30 years. It's just not going to happen. No way. Yeah. You know, and it's never too late to start. I think I, I agree with that, but I think that for some people, for a lot of people, that method is more difficult than the, um, you know, if you set a goal, like you were saying, the first method, um, building it from the, from the bottom up, setting the, setting the goal, it, people have something to look forward to. But if they're looking into the future, it's really hard to actually um, to envision yourself, you know, in, you might feel really unhealthy now, but if someone says, imagine being, you know, double your weight or imagine you're going to have, you know, lung cancer because of your smoking, it's, it's hard to put, actually really imagine that until it happens. So I find like um, it's quite easy to put things off, even though, you know, people know that if they eat junk food and they don't exercise, you know, they're going to get mm. overweight. And if people smoke yeah. a lot, they're, they're going to get sick. But until it happens and then the problem is it's often too late because in the moment you feel immortal and you notice maybe the small changes you might notice a bit of weight here and there and you know a little bit of a cough but it's not enough to actually make you plan ahead mm -hmm. really yeah and there's there's things we can do about that for example uh, who do you know who hasn't stopped smoking 20 years ago maybe you mm -hmm. can have a conversation with them i think alan carr he wrote that book about smoking and like so many people yes. i know they've read it and they stopped smoking um yes. and i think part of it is uh, go to a cancer ward you know Look at some people with lung cancer, talk to their families, you know, uh, have a chat with them. And, you know, that experience, because it's a, the intellectual exercise might not be enough to help you stop a certain behavior. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being in relation with somebody who's telling you, look, I, I wish I wish I would have done it. I, I wish because I'm going to die and, you know, I'm not going to see my grandkid. I'm not going to get to meet them, you know, and that's yeah. because I didn't stop smoking. If you if you talk to somebody and you have that, um, that experience of relating to them and seeing their pain, mm -hmm. feeling it, you know, empathizing with it, you know, that can really shift somebody very powerfully. Well, that's, yeah, I, I, I'm lucky. I feel that I've, I, I've kind of have made myself come to some realizations in my life about, you know, the way that I live and my lifestyle. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it's just a really scary thing to actually make that change and 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 yeah. to get out of a habit as well if you're comfortable doing something and especially if you get pleasure out of it you know whether whether that is eating that pizza and if you're just on lockdown you're feeling depressed you're feeling isolated so you just you know just it's mm -hmm. the easy thing to turn to it's a lot easier than mm -hmm. uh picking up a set of weights or uh, pick, picking up a salad for sure i mean first of all habits are a bitch you know, bad yeah. habits can be really difficult to kick, um, especially if they're really ingrained into your way of being and they have been established, uh, you know, very early in life. And, you know, they're mm -hmm. part of you. Sometimes they're part of your identity. And then you would have to change your identity. How many people, like they're smokers, we call them smokers. It's part yeah. of their identity, you know, and it's really difficult to, to drop that because then you're, you're not going to be a smoker. So, you know, then you're excluded from the circles that go like outside the pub or that used to yeah. like, you know, um, there's, there's, there's something around that. I mean, it's when they're very deep and they're very established, it's very difficult to kick, um, very strong habits become addictions, you know, and uh, so there, there's a line there, but there's lots of habits that we have and we can uh, target the habit loops. Um, Atomic Habits is a really good book. Um, the other one is uh, The Power of Habit. Um, but Charles okay. doing. Um, so this is something I would recommend people to look into if they want to build more um, positive habits, um, because we can use an understanding of how they work uh, to in our favor. But any change is scary, you know. Um, yeah, for sure. So it, it's difficult. But one other thing that I really recommend people look into is the. the have you have you seen the marshmallow experiment? Uh, no, I haven't. No, what is that? Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, the video is amazing. Uh, basically, uh, what they're looking into is delayed gratification. Um, because we were talking about, well, I, I want to get instant gratification. And I think, uh, yeah. we mentioned millennials, you know, there's a generation that is used to getting instant gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we get the whole season on Netflix now, you know, we, we don't need to go to the cinema on Friday. We just watch it straight away. 
You know, uh, we are so used to getting everything immediately. Um, that's not helpful uh, in some ways, you know, but uh, technology often makes it possible. Um, but like other generations, they're much more used to working very hard to get certain mm -hmm. results. Um, so the marshmallow experiment uh, looked at um, delayed gratification and they, they uh, gave uh, kids uh, aged, um, I think they did it with four to seven year olds. Um, they gave them a marshmallow in an empty room and said, if you wait for 10 minutes before you eat it, I'll give you another one. And then they left <laughs> and then they had a camera on them and they tried to like, some just ate it all immediately. <laughs> um, others just waited, trying to distract themselves in some way, you know, to not, but they weren't allowed to get up from the chair. So the marshmallow was oh, right there. Torture. It was really difficult for them. <laughs> well, it wasn't torture because they could eat it straight away. And it's really? fine. <laughs> yeah. You know? But if they did choose to wait, they get another one. Oh. Um, the interesting thing is then afterwards they followed them up uh, over a period of like 10 20 years uh, in a very in a range of different experiments um, or different studies um, and the ones who were able to delay gratification um, had a whole range of positive effects on them you know they had better jobs they had, more money, they had better relationships Whoa. across the board it affected people so much to develop that kind of self-regulation and discipline <laughs> To, to delay gratification and get it later, to wait for a more benefit later. I mean, that's why we study. That's why we go to universities. So we do, you know, uh, we, do, we do things that we don't necessarily enjoy for a later benefit. True, yeah. You know? So it's really useful skill. But on the other hand, if we do that too much, we're not living now, mm -hmm. you know, and then we kind of prepare that. for something that might or might not come later, you know, and I'm, I've always been a used to good China now kind of guy, you know, have that experience now. Um, because you know you might get hit by a bus tomorrow and what a waste that would be that's true. but you might have another 30 40 50 60 years to go <laughs> yeah so, you know i i think it, if possible if you can balance it that's the ideal way really uh -huh. i mean uh, how did these kids uh the kids who did was it a lot of them that actually didn't eat the marshmallow do you know um i don't know the actual numbers um i think it ranges depending on where those kids are what the but the important thing is that those who did it, what other characteristics and uh, metrics do yeah. they have? Going That's what forward. I was going to ask is like, what do they, what other characteristics do they have and why, where do they come from as such? Because, yeah. you know, is it children of a certain uh, monetary financial background, you know, upbringing uh, would eat the marshmallow straight away? And, or is it children, was, you know, do you know if, it, if certain, if it is uh, just nature, nurture, genetics that makes you like this? What do you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would have to look at the numbers. Um, yeah. I don't know that from the bottom of my from the bottom of my heart, from the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, the book is great. Um, uh, oh, the name escapes me right now. Um, but the, I listened to the audio book, and uh, I mean, I knew about the studies, but at some point, I, I listened to the audio book, and the the narrator is just this wonderful, warm, older voice. Um, it's just very soothing to listen to. Uh, Michels, uh, Walter Michels. Ah, yeah. Is this the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment? Yeah, that's it. Here we go. Oh, so there's a, there's a lot. Of, Stanford is the prison experiment as well, right? Yeah, Zimbardo. Yeah, and there's been quite a few, uh, I guess, iconic psychological experiments done there, really. Oh, yeah. So. The work around mindsets as well. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that's kind of what we touched on in a way, you know, and talking about perspectives. Um, uh, Carol Dweck is from Stanford as well. And she talks about growth and fixed mindset, you know, fixed mindset uh, being the belief that we are, we are fixed in certain things. I'm just not good at, let's say numbers or, no. um, you know, people or, you know, whatever you might think you're not good at um, because the brain is something that's fixed. You know, a talent is something that you either have or you don't. And uh, a growth mindset um, sees any kind of challenge or failure that happens in your life as, mm -hmm. as uh, an opportunity for growth and learning. Definitely. You know? So when we find like an encounter, a certain obstacle, or we fail at something, something doesn't work out. You know, if we adopt a growth mindset on that, we appreciate it. It still sucks, you know, that it didn't work out, but yeah. we, we just appreciate it as, as something that happens and we can get better you learn at from things. your losses and you learn yeah. from your mistakes, right? Rather than like, get, I'm you know. not good at this yet. If I were to put time yeah. into learning about it and studying it and practicing and training, I could become good at that. 
And if we Definitely. if we look at that, that's often in the way when we develop good habits. Oh, I'm just not an athletic person. Now that's bullshit. Anybody yeah. can become an athletic person, you know. Yes. And if you're if if you're disabled in terms of your body, there's some form of athletics that you can usually do. You can do some yeah. form of movement. Obviously, like there's people who are ill and they can't do sports because they have a condition, you know. They but you can they can still move their body. They can still take care of their health. You know, mm -hmm. and then it's, uh, you need to work with how do you frame it? You know, maybe it's not an athletic person, but maybe you can be a person who takes care of their health as best as possible. Yeah. You know, and anybody can learn almost anything. Obviously there's limits of what we can achieve. Not everybody will become an astronaut if they just put their mind to it. That's bullshit, you know, but yeah. you can, you can uh, become the kind of person that you want. You can learn new skills. You know, maybe you don't have an innate talent for musicality, but you can certainly learn to play an instrument to a reasonable Definitely. degree and make music. That's that's literally that's probably the one that I experienced the most with uh, with so many people. Like you know, many times I've been at parties and there's a, a, a guitar going around. You know, I play some songs, and then some, inevitably it comes to passing at someone, and they just oh, I'm just not musical. I'm not musical. And I say, what do you mean you're not musical? I just I just yeah, make some noise. Like, yeah like come on like you you are you have the ability to create music we all do just like yeah. you, you might not have uh, had the advantage to be encouraged with music as a child but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you can't pick up a guitar and i'm sure if you spend 20 minutes a day or uh, one hour a week twiddling away you're going to learn a few chords within you know probably a few hours um mm -hmm. yeah you... like drawing for example oh i can't draw yeah. like uh, so i don't do it in my coaching <laughs> much anymore but like uh, I, when i used to and uh, experiment with that a little bit like i can't draw like what do you mean? You you can't draw to a certain perceived standard of quality. True. You know, I no. can't draw uh, um, like a person so that it looks realistic. But anybody can draw something that resembles a person. You know, yeah. anybody can put something on a piece of paper that is like shapes and colors and means something. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Is there anything you uh, do you have set yourself like challenges of, of things like that you can't do right now that you want to do? Is that how you do you, do you like create lists or do you do resolutions or that kind of thing? I'm careful with resolutions uh, just because like I used to be a total drifter, just kind of taking life as it unfolds itself. And I, mm -hmm. and I kind of became a dynamic drifter, uh, which like I knew this coaching, positive psychology, personal development thing is going to be something that I'm probably going to do for the rest of my life. But I didn't really know what was going to happen and how and where I would be yeah. in five years. Um, and then at some point, I decided to add more focus to my life. And I think uh, uh, a big event was meeting my now wife you know, that mm -hmm. kind of um, invited me, not her, but like that event invited me to question how am I living my life? And uh, I wasn't like, I had my issues with commitment because every commitment excludes a lot of other possibilities in life. Yes. And that's scary. You know, when we, choose, when we choose a certain person or a certain path or a certain job or a certain degree mm -hmm. or, you know, move into a certain country. Um, we exclude a lot of other versions of ourselves that we're not going to become anymore. Um, and at that point, I realized this is such an important thing for me that I'm, I'm willing to commit to it and bear the anxiety that comes with it, you know? And that's a, that was a beautiful Whoa. process, you know, because it focused me. It opened a sea of anxiety because I'm, I'm like, I couldn't be so many versions of myself now that I'm committing to fall in love with this person and spend the rest of my life with them. But at the same time, it added focus and meaning and purpose to my life. And I chose a certain path, you know, and that path is still reasonably open, but yeah. that is a certain path I chose. And uh, that changed a lot of things in my life um, because wow. that allowed me to then, you know, close my eyes and envision that, you know, picture myself in Mexico, you know, picture mm -hmm. myself building the kind of business that I want to build that would I feel that would make the world a better place and would have the kind of impact on, on people and organizations and leaders that I would want to have uh, the kind of impact, you know? I, I have a certain, I, I realize that I, I feel a certain obligation to give something back to my community um, because I've received so much um, the way that I grew up, you know? So I, I had a really deep think around what do I actually value, what's important to me and how can I create a path that would 
involve as many of that as possible while being able to use as many of my strengths as possible. So with all of that knowledge I've gathered through positive psychology and through the existential coaching masters and like through all of my work with my coaches and um, all the conversations that I've had, um, I, I created and forged a certain direction and path along the way, something that I would think is meaningful. And I used a lot of visualization and I used a lot of plans and I did write a business plan about what, six years, seven years after I intended to write one, <laughs> but uh, it's not a set in stone thing. It gives me an, a direction. It sets an intention of the kind of impact that I want to have in the world. Yeah. And that's a really useful thing. And then I started working, looking at the people that have similar, similar mission and similar values and started grouping them around me. You know, so now I'm working with a, with a team of three in my business and uh, I, I'm in touch and I, networking was something I always hated, you know, because I, I thought that really? that's, you're, you're trying to go around um, and tell people that you're awesome and getting other people to help you. But really networking is about finding the people that you like and you would love to see succeed, the people that you yeah. value, the people that you consider great people and then and figure out a way to help them. I find like you, you must, I, that's quite surprising to hear that it wasn't something that you did or liked because you seem, yeah, natural, you know, you're, you're drawn to people, you're very engaging, you listen to people. So like I, I would have thought you would be, you know, if you weren't doing this, I could imagine you would uh, be very successful in, uh, um, in, in Silicon Valley or in some other high, high power business because yeah, you, you seem naturally good at uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm connecting in the moment very, very, very well. You know, I really love connecting with people. Yeah. But the, there's a strategic element that it seemed to me, you know, it's like checking in with people every three months. Some people don't hear from me for like a year or two, mm -hmm. but I, I hold them dearly in my heart and I really yeah. like them. I just didn't check in with them, you know. I think about them often sometimes, but I don't really reach out. And I think that's yeah. something uh, that changes slowly. You know, that is like, you don't need a reason to call somebody up and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, and I think right now during lockdown, there's everybody has a reason to check up with people that I haven't talked to in a while. Um, but okay. somehow I felt I needed a reason. And somehow networking felt to me like a strategy to like get some value for yourself. When really I kind of shifted that and I thought, you know, who, who are the people that I respect that I would love to have around me who, you know, what can I do for you, mate? How can I help you with this? Yeah. You know, what's going on for you? You're, you're interesting. I love what you do. You know, what do you got going on? I'm actually curious, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm still not on top of my game. Like if anybody listening to this and we haven't spoken in a while, do reach out. I'd love to hear from you. But like, <laughs> um, it's still oh. difficult for me to, uh, to be more, more strategic around that and just kind of see what people are up to. It's not a personal thing, is it? That's the thing. It's, it's, it, you, like you said, you hold people still dear to you, to your heart, but when, when there's so much going on, you might think of somebody in the moment, but that moment is not possible for you to reach out to them then. And by the time that moment has passed for then it's another moment. So yeah. yeah so here's a good intervention. Anybody who's listening to this right now, think of one person you haven't spoken to in a while, but you really like them, you know, just go give them a call, write them an email, send them a text and say, Hey, what's great up? idea. <laughs> I'd actually, I'd like to do, uh, maybe we can do a few things like this now. Um, so if you, uh, maybe some suggestions for people who are stuck in lockdown and either completely on their own um, and feeling low about themselves, maybe they're living in a, in a city, in an apartment, um, just them and their cat, or maybe they don't even have a cat um, and uh, uh, they're, they're feeling okay. low. <laughs> what, what would you, uh, uh, what would be your, for your few tips, easy, quick tips, just to start to have a positive mindset and um yeah a couple of things um beyond reach out connect with somebody you know yeah. um if you look at uh, theories on well-being and psychological well-being and uh, and happiness um there's a couple of a bunch of good things you can do uh, so we mentioned the basics eat well you know mm -hmm. eat healthy exercise yeah. Meditate, any form of meditation. Meditation is basically uh, training to be in charge of where your attention goes, you know, and there's so many different ways. Uh, it's not about uh, sitting cross-legged with a straight back and grinning like an idiot. It's really just about grounding yourself in the present moment, you know, and 
if you do that, if you learn that skill and it, it can take a couple of weeks or a couple of months or even a couple of years, depending on how busy your mind is and how yeah. you're wired and how quickly you learn. But if you commit to yourself uh, to a journey of learning to control where your attention goes, there's an incredible freedom in that. And uh, you can do it anywhere, anytime you want, you know, just practice that muscle of, of choosing where your attention goes. And uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs I had in my learning journey was rather than to see it as a failure every time you catch your mind being somewhere completely different, you see it as a success every time you bring it back to the present moment. So yes. just sit down and notice what you can smell, what you can hear, shapes and colors. Don't judge, don't interpret them. You know, it's like sitting at a train station, watching the trains go past, you know, uh, trains of thoughts. And... I guarantee you at some point you'll find yourself in Sydney and you're like, how did I get here? And, <laughs> oh, yeah, I was thinking about that. And then I was thinking about that. And then I think about that. And then, I, oh, okay. But the good thing is you can yeah. always teleport back to the present moment, you know? Yeah. And the more often you manage to teleport back, the more you flex your muscle. And if you do that for a couple of weeks or months, I guarantee you the time you find yourself in Sydney or, you know, then perhaps a little bit less further away. And yeah. at some point, you, you the, for the first time, you realize there's a train that's going past and you want to get on the train, but then you <laughs> choose not to. And at some point, you just see the trains go past and you just kind of observe. You're in the present with yourself these, in the now. Yeah, these thought events. You know, you oh. are not your thoughts. They're just kind of events that happen. And it's really useful to follow them because they lead you to some amazing places. Mm -hmm. you know, I'd love to go to Sydney. I've actually never been. But uh, it should be a choice. I, I shouldn't find myself in Sydney all Drifting of a sudden. There, yeah, without... Even though I wanted to like really listen to what somebody is saying or like just spend time in the present, relaxing my mind. Um, so eat healthy, exercise, um, meditate, um, and sleep. You know, uh, these are things that you can start building into your mm -hmm. life. Connect with a friend. Um, you could uh, you could uh, induce some positive emotions. You know, look at, uh, make an album on your phone with like some of your favorite or most meaningful memories. You know, um, everybody has some good memories. Capture them somewhere. You know, um, listen to some music and do a little dance, <laughs> you know. Move your body. Moving your body is really good. Even if it feels oh, silly, amazing. home alone with only your cat, go get silly, <laughs> you know. Dance like an idiot. It's something that the School of Life uh, has a really good video out there on that. Um, I find myself doing that last uh, last weekend. I, um, I actually stayed at my friend's house, but in the morning I got up. It was beautiful outside and he's on the river. Uh, he lives on the riverfront. I went to the bottom of his garden and I put some music on. got some reggae and some two-tone ska. And <laughs> next thing I know, I realized I'm out there. I've been a few hours. I'm just skanking away, dancing. And, and I had this, there was a moment where I was like, oh, shit like people can see me because there's like you know, a footpath and there's a, a window of this house and there's a guy who was always sat there and he can look in and I'm like oh no and then I was, you know what fuck it who cares so I just was and how warm and incredible I felt after that it was amazing I just let it go I probably looked like a proper proper loony you know I was just there was there was no there was no uh, uh finesse in that dancing but I was just stomping my feet and jumping around and, and waving my hands and my, my maybe twerking a bit to the reggae beat you know <laughs> but uh yeah it felt great <laughs> Yeah, if we can free ourselves from what other people think of us, you know, it's really liberating. I, I get I get why some people struggle with that, you know, and again, it, it probably lies somewhere in their past and, you know, what they've been told about how we should act and should yes. behave, all those shoulds. Um, but yeah, um, if you haven't looked up the School of Life and do some teaching for the School of Life and their materials are amazing and a lot of them are free, you know, their, their YouTube channel is, is fantastic and uh, they have this book of life um that's completely free you know they, they charge a lot for like lots of other stuff um yeah. but they also provide a lot of free value so if you're sitting at home and you're alone um learn about yourself you know there's no more beautiful journey than to discover yourself and who you are and there's lots of really good stuff um so, so I, I recommend to to look at there's so much free stuff out there about personal development it's a it's a beautiful world so and, anyone can um, just go on to youtube and see that yeah, YouTube, School of Life, uh, they, they of produce life. a video every week or so, and uh, they're all free. Um, the YouTube channel, some, I said sometimes it pays for itself, mm -hmm. um, but usually they invest money in it. 
you know um so they finance the youtube channel through yep. some of their products and uh, the work they do with organizations so that uh, lots of people can actually access all of that stuff for free and what do you do with them sorry you teach yeah i teach uh, well i used to teach the classes here in uh, in london there's a group of facilitators the teaching faculty um okay. and they run these uh, live classes there i think on, like every two days every like there's a lot of them during the month um and they have like 12 different modules uh, of stuff about the self um mm -hmm. about relationships about you know finding love finding good career finding the meaning of life um how to get to how to develop self knowledge or build confidence really practical things uh, and alanda baton who runs the the thing is uh, i really like him uh, he's yeah. a he's a philosopher a very practical philosopher and uh, i i really like that moment there was a moment when i found out he's still alive because i figured he's a philosopher so he must be dead yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's alive and kicking and he's uh, he's, he's, built, he's written all the materials so that is uh, that is something i can recommend they're awesome nice I actually I can't believe um we kind of we jumped straight into it I was I I was planning to get you to uh actually introduce yourself a bit about what you know your background <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I mean we've skipped all of that and just gone straight into oh, well. the um cuz like I I said at the beginning to anyone who is jumping in now I um I just kind of said a, a little bit about what you do and um mm -hmm. but you you know I originally met you and knew you as a um DJ musician you know you're obviously you still are but like you have these uh, so many i don't know different <laughs> different perspectives different angle uh, almost i don't want to say personality characters because it's all you still but you know you're uh, it's amazing to see you know that you have these you, you're this uh, lecturer you're this dj kind of party guy you can go wild you know you're also this absolutely very articulated you know speaker you've written books um what how how did you how did you get to um where you are i mean huh. yeah when, when did you start really going down this path you know were you a teenager and just started you know partying at first and find <laughs> the right path well um That's a big question, right? Um yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I guess the the thing that it has in common is um uh, uh an urge to express myself and to find something that means something to connect with people that I feel connected to. Um so I I really found myself within hip hop culture that was like mm -hmm. when around 15, you know, when you kind of personality really kind of comes out. Um I I really responded and uh, related to that making something out of nothing to that uh, expression of yourself to there not being any rules you can just like be yourself you know and put that out there um yeah. you know DJing freestyling rapping um you know uh, did like um dancing um writing there's there's so much uh, that was just a pure form of self expression of of putting what you think and what you are and what you represent and putting it out there you know and i love the creativity and i love the style of it um and at some point for example at some point i listened to less and less music um and i was a bit like i was djing less and i was was a bit worried at some point and then i realized oh it's because now a lot of that self expression is coming from the coaching is coming mm. from relating to people in a different kind of way because for yeah. me hip hop was always a, a way to relate to yourself and to relate to people you know that for me personally there's many yeah. different I wrote my dissertation about like hip hop and what it does for your well-being and what's it connected to and why people get into it what me, was the title of that sorry the title oh, it's called uh, get happy or die trying um uh and then a very boring academic title get out of your diet trying <laughs> <laughs> yeah i always have these two parts something catchy and then what it actually is uh Brilliant. and i was looking at uh, uh the correlations between well-being and uh motivation within hip hop culture um it's on my website existential.coach you can you can find it in the resource section uh, cool. i think you would actually really enjoy that because nice, i go yeah. into the history of hip hop and how it developed um and then how it's related to well-being theories um and uh yeah for me coaching was the same thing like I, i got to express myself i got to connect to people um i got to follow something that is interesting where i can use my strength and my creativity you know where i can feel i have an impact on people because when i was writing i was writing 
to make people think, you know, and now I can be in a coaching session with somebody and creating that space where they think and I can ask them questions, uh, not through lyrics, but because I'm asking them a question, they consider it. And I have a much more immediate response to that. You know, um, we put an album out back then, but like uh, you, you are usually not there when people are listening to it. You know, and I got a lot from the live gigs because you get kind of the response from the audience. But with the kind of writing that I did was quite philosophical. I always felt that a lot of the nuanced, uh, like philosophical stuff that I put into those lyrics, they didn't really arrive, you know, or, mm -hmm. or if they did really make somebody think, they, they weren't there to have a conversation with me about it. Yeah. So I think that's why, uh, and also maybe it's an age thing, but it doesn't have to be. There's a lot of the like older hip hoppers out there. But like yeah. for me, I got a lot more immediate response to 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 that, and uh, it just for me it made more sense to kind of take my life in that direction. You know, I still have a very huge record collection, <laughs> and mm -hmm. I really absolutely and love that '90s sound. Um, but like, uh, I love the creative expression, and it just it there's certain things when people do different things. What I'm what I'm interested in is what's the common ground? You know, what drives you to do that thing and also that thing. Like um, my intern, for example, she's a she's a super gifted photographer, and she's also a positive psychology coach. And it, it was it like it was clear that they were about the same thing. They were about helping somebody to see themselves, you know, helping somebody to gain confidence. Uh, it was a process for somebody to look in the mirror and be proud of what they see, you know, both the coaching and the photography, you know. So that was that was beautiful. Um, and I, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, um, I mean, there's so much, there's such a long journey to that, what got me here, but I guess yeah. that's, that's part of the essence of it. Do you still make music yourself now? Um, there's always music in my head. Um, I still, I still have my record set up. I still listen to a yeah. lot of records. I just, uh, just picked up a record collection. Oh, last time we saw each other, I just picked mm -hmm, up a yeah. collection from a friend of mine. Um, so I still listen to a lot of music. Um, I'm not producing music anymore uh, in terms of how I used to, uh, in terms of making beats or something, mm -hmm. but I, I still mix, you know, I don't yeah. mix so much at home anymore, but for me, I realized it, it's all, it's all mixing because it's about integration. It's about bringing different things together and making them into a meaningful whole, yeah. you know, and you used to do that with lyrics and beats. And now then I used to do that with, positive psychology science and existential philosophy and coaching brought them together, integrate them in a meaningful yeah. way. You know, um, now I do that with helping people in their life to do that, you know, to mm -hmm. take different areas of their life and integrate them in a meaningful way, do a really beautiful mix. And there's no bigger joy for me than when a mix really works and you don't have to do anything and it just works and everybody's everything is synchronized and the two records run well and they go so well with each other and you just step back for a moment you're like ah oh, nice until you have to go and work on it again so, yeah and make the next one <laughs> yeah so you're kind of mixing i'm always mixing uh, my own life other people's lives you know it's like uh, every really? mind is a canvas in that way i never 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 really looked at it like that but that is for yourself that is you're a dj you're a mixer in in, yeah. in all all of your aspects like that is yeah you're constantly looking for synchronicity and making sure that it runs smoothly whether it's on the decks or mm -hmm. with with people i, like, I think thinking about it now i think that's why i didn't like the the auto bpm the auto tune kind of button you know because mixing mm -hmm. became so easy yeah. when when you're mixing with vinyl there is no button that you can press that keeps the yeah. two records perfectly in sync you know, it's very rare that you can like adjust the two records to mix perfectly in tune. For those who don't know how to DJ vinyl, like you, you have to adjust the tempo of the two records that you have playing so well that they run at exactly or almost exactly the same speed. And usually what you find you need to do is you always have to control a little bit. You have to adjust a little bit the tempo, you know, because they're so never that's... completely the same. It's like when you run, ride a bicycle, you never ride a bicycle in a straight line. It's impossible. You always have to slightly correct, yeah. you know? So it's always like going a little bit in and a little bit out and mm -hmm. you're just trying to keep on path. And that's the same thing. And that's the same thing with, uh, with living an authentic life. You know, Heidegger wrote about it, uh, that you, you can only weave in and out of authenticity. You cannot become authentic and then stay that way. You know, there's always going to be things that happen um, that kind of get you a little bit off course. And yeah. sometimes if you don't pay attention, 
you might get a lot of course, you know, and then you kind of have to steer back. And so it's a continual process of uh, staying authentic, you know, or become authentic again after you left. And that's the same thing when you mix vinyl. So I think that's why I never like to push a button and all of a sudden yeah. everything is computer generated. I think it's too easy. It's not what life is. It's probably nice to, um, or easier to make the subtle changes, whether that's on the vinyl or, or the bike or, or any, in any aspect in life, rather than, yeah, if you make the big change, if you get pulled off course massively, you don't notice, and then you have to mm. correct yourself. Mm -hmm. um, instead, you just make these small subtle changes constantly Mm -hmm. rather than allowing it to drift massively which yeah. means and look keeping at, yourself in check yeah and what we have all done as kids on a bike we yeah, <laughs> yeah. we live for the turns man that's what yeah. <laughs> lies, you know uh, get a bit out of balance um that's you know that makes life worth living you know if we're all going perfectly yeah. straight all the time well, life would be pretty boring so uh, um we i, I want to we are just looking now we're near we've gone we've gone over our, well we don't have a scheduled time but you know we've done I over do. the I hour of the zoom meeting <laughs> <laughs> okay well um, what what i wanted to uh, ask and get you to say is a bit about your your books quickly and uh, get a chance for you know because you've said some pretty in, insightful interesting things i'm sure people want to look up um read up more about you uh, what what would you what would you recommend and, and what have you written so far that i know mm -hmm. you've got two books out right um, sort of. Um, so I got one that is published by by a big publishing house. Uh, that's the that's my introduction to existential coaching. So anybody who's interested in in some of the stuff I was talking about about you know the human condition and you know, dilemma and paradox and but how we can view it in a in a positive light, how we can use it in coaching. So it's written for coaches, but I think anybody who's interested in a tangible, easy to understand uh, introduction to existential yep. philosophy, an introduction to existential coaching will be, uh, will be interesting to them. Um, <clears throat> I've, um, I've got a little book on positive psychology for coaches as well. Um, so again, it's an introduction technically made for written for coaches, but anybody who's interested in the science of positive psychology, they can look it up. Um, cool. I've got a YouTube channel, um, Yannick Jacob, um, where you'll find lots of like the talks and lectures I've done. I'm not a super content producer kind of guy, but um, whenever I did a conference or a talk or, um, you know, I run a few podcasts as well and uh, publish very um, unregularly. Um, but there's cool. some really interesting conversations. Uh, and if you want to hear more kind of like this one, but uh, sometimes, well, more focused on other people, I reckon. Okay. Um, the YouTube channel is a good, a good, um, a good address. And obviously I've got my website, uh, existential.coach, um, that kind of like summarizes the different, uh, services I offer. And it's got a huge resource section with like that, uh, dissertation on hip hop. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of other articles or like anything I've kind of published. Um, lots of it is obviously in the coaching area. Um, but there's something about conflict resolution, about happiness, about uh, interventions that you can do. Um, so that, there's a lot there. If you, if you wanted to explore right. more about what I do and how I think, um, existential.coach is, uh, is a good address. Awesome. Cool. I've, uh, yeah, always a pleasure, man. To, always good. To, it's, it's always too long uh, to, between seeing you. <laughs> but um, yeah, absolute pleasure to, to have you on. And ho hopefully, um, I don't know, in a few months, maybe you can, uh, you'll be able to come out to the Netherlands and we can, we can get you on and um, maybe, maybe your fine, lovely wife, Nelly, would uh, like to jump on as well, uh, you know, because obviously she's also very, very, very intellectual psychologist as well and we can do another mm -hmm. podcast with with all of us but this time we can you know have a couple of glasses of wine whilst we're doing it and uh, yeah <laughs> argue about not... lacanian psychoanalysis together <laughs> um, uh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. man ash it's always a pleasure absolutely i can only uh, return that sentiment and uh, i do hope that uh, you know all of this uh, crazy situation gets uh, lifted a little bit and we're able to to go travel and visit Cool. Thanks so much. Um, I will just, um, if you want to just leave the conversation and then this will be uploaded shortly, I will say bye to everybody else. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Anik. I'll do that. Speak soon, Jesh. Cool. See you. Bye. -bye.
thanks so much everybody um that was pretty insightful i absolutely love speaking to yannick he came out last time to visit me in the netherlands and i went to his wedding him and nelly's wedding in mexico always always mind opening conversations and yeah this was no different so thank you so much for everybody tuning in um as he said uh stay positive during this keep communicating reach out to somebody if you can think of somebody right now that you haven't spoke to in a while just send them a message and say hello and please like and share shifty perspective please uh we are now on all of the podcast platforms we're on apple podcasts we are on I don't know what they are, but we're on all of them apparently. So reach out and uh, please like and follow our Instagram and our Facebook page. And if you get a chance, hit the share button on Facebook and invite your friends because we'd like to grow. And if you've got any uh, chance for other guests that you want to see on, then just drop us a message because who knows, always open to have some interesting, insightful people on. Thank you so much for your time. And I will see you next week. Same time next week. Stay shifty.